favor. I don't know. Oh, there. Yeah, it's kind of shaky. Right? I got it. This is a different version. This is what I have to face with. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Version two. Yeah. No. You know, after Friday, or the fourth, hopefully, progress in uh, understanding collision with shocks from first principles. Uh, the heavily numerical research we've been doing um, at Princeton and trying to uh, explain the uh, microphysics of what's going on behind the uh, mantra of collision with shocks. They do everything for us in astrophysics, but how they do it uh, is a big question that I'll try to answer today. So, um, okay. Okay, uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, okay, Oops. Something's going Okay, great. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators uh, from uh, Berkeley uh, and uh, Princeton. And uh, so let's uh, quickly uh, explain the obvious. So the obvious is that I'm not going to talk about shocks like this. Uh, so the typical shocks. Um, uh, what is a shock? It's a basically a sudden change in density, temperature, and pressure that comes about when you're trying to decelerate a supersonic flow. And uh, in most of the examples you're familiar with from the everyday life, like a sonic boom uh, or a shock in the, uh, in, in the fluid, uh, your, uh, the typical shock thickness is driven by the uh, mean free pass of uh, Coulomb collisions, right? And uh, in air, the typical mean free pass is just a micron. So any shock you have on Earth is going to be dominated by uh, binary collisions <coughs> between particles. Uh, that's not the case, uh, of course, in astrophysics, uh, where we have a uh, mean free pass that is much larger than all the scales of interest. And uh, since there's going to be a Lansing workshop here, I couldn't resist putting this picture on. Uh, so uh, 
typical mean free pass uh, in a supernova remnant, if you just calculate the Coulomb collision cross section, is going to be much larger than the size of the supernova remnant. You get the thousand parsecs. Uh, it could be a megaparsec in the galaxy cluster. So uh, something else has to be happening if, because we know that shocks exist. Sharp discontinuity in fluids uh, do exist in supernova remnants and many other examples, I'll, as I'll show uh, on the So what this means is that uh, somehow the shocks have to be mediated without uh, binary collisions, uh, most likely because of the uh, interaction with collective electromagnetic fields uh, that are excited in the plasma. So hence uh, collisionless shocks. So here are uh, typical uh, examples uh, you think about when, when you talk about collisionless shocks. So uh, they span a range of properties, as I'll uh, talk in a few slides. A uh, range of properties both in terms of the speed, in terms of the composition of the flow, in terms of the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, but they all seem to be uh, doing similar things. So first of all, they, they are shocks. They can uh, mediate collisions, they can decelerate flows. Uh, they also can accelerate particles. So uh, here is a, a typical examples going from pulsar wind nebulae to supernova remnants to jets, uh, shocks in jets of uh, active galactic nuclei uh, to gamma ray bursts. Uh, almost everywhere you see featureless power law uh, spectra, uh, which we interpret as uh, accelerated particles, presumably accelerated due to some sort of Fermi process scattering around shocks. So, all astrophysical shocks seem to be able, or at least the ones that we observe, uh, seem to be able to accelerate uh, particles. Uh, uh, also, uh, they seem to be able to generate uh, significant magnetic fields. So in some examples that I'll describe in gamma ray bursts and supernova remnants, we think that the, uh, the magnetic fields are amplified to levels much more than you would expect from just pure compression uh, of the flow uh, coming through the shock. Uh, they also do interesting things uh, about equilibrating temperatures between ions and electrons. So uh, in this naive way, if you think about ions and electrons going through a shock, if there are no uh, co collisions, they should just uh, isotropize to their own temperature. And there, isn't, there shouldn't be much exchange of uh, energy between the two species. That doesn't uh, seem to be the case. So uh, let me just run through a few examples uh, so we're uh, on the same page. Uh, about the properties of these uh, flows. So I'm personally very interested in relativistic shocks and relativistic flows, but we will talk about non-relativistic examples as well. So uh, a prototypical example of a relativistic shock is a pulsar wind nebula. So uh, uh, let's see, here, here is a, here is a, a collection of uh, different Chandra images of pulsar wind nebulae. So what we're observing here is a central pulsar emitting relativistic wind. Uh, that uh, upon interaction with the surrounding uh, nebula uh, produces a shock. So here is a shock in the crab, uh, for instance, the inner ring in the crab X-ray image is understood as uh, a shock in the relativistic outflow. Similar rings are seen in other uh, uh, examples of pulsar wind nebulae. Uh, the way we understand it is that this shock is happening where the pressure balance between the um, ram pressure of the outflow uh, comes to be equal to the pressure in the nebula. And uh, these shocks uh, are relativistic. They decelerate the flow from about gamma of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 4 upstream uh, to basically have the speed of light after the shock. Uh, they also display a range of uh, uh, magnetizations, namely the, uh, pr the magnetic fields that are present in the flow uh, are typically inferred to be small from modeling the nebula. So uh, this parameter sigma that will appear uh, several times in the talk, which is basically the ratio of magnetic energy to the kinetic energy in the flow, uh, it's uh, on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 1. So these are relatively uh, weakly magnetized uh, outflows, but the magnetic field is nevertheless important. Why is it important? Because what we're observing is uh, a synchrotron emission from these nebulas. So, here is an example of the crab nebula. You're seeing the uh, s images from radio going down to X-ray. Uh, they're not exactly to scale, but you, you get roughly the idea. Uh, the, uh, the higher the energy you go to, the smaller the nebula appears, which means that there is a single source of injection of relativistic particles uh, that are going to be emitting synchrotron radiation. And uh, that source of injection uh, ultimately is, of course, a pulsar. But we think that the actual spectrum of particles is being produced at this inner shock uh, in, the, in the outflow. And the spectrum uh, 
goes all the way from radio down to uh, ga gamma ray energies. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one, uh, uh, the composition of this flow we think of are mostly electron positron pairs, although there is uh, a potentially a significant component of ions also present in the flow. So it would be interesting if we could, by modeling these shocks, if we could infer what was the composition of the flow. Because it seems like there are no other ways of definitively inferring what is the composition. We never see the annihilation line. It's too, too small, a smaller density to see, uh, to convincingly show that these are electron positron pairs. So uh, perhaps by modeling how these uh, power law spectra occur, we could potentially constrain this composition. Uh, another example. Uh, gamma ray bursts. So um, the zero to order picture for gamma ray bursts, as you uh, probably know, is uh, we have um, a an exploding uh, massive star that produces a uh, ultra relativistic jet that somehow escapes the uh, confines of the star, and then uh, the relativistic jet moving with gammas on the order of a hundred uh, undergoes uh, internal shocks, uh, which uh, shells of, uh, of matter collide together, produce internal shocks, and those shocks emit uh, gamma rays. And um, uh, that's the prompt emission. And then this ultra-relativistic flow collides with the interstellar medium, and you see uh, an afterglow from a shock driven into the external medium. So <coughs> here's in the afterglow stage, you have another shock uh, now colliding uh, with the interstellar medium. So Gamma reverse are wonderful because they provide you a range of different shocks. So there is uh, internal shocks which we think are mildly relativistic. So these are two relativistic shells, but only approaching each other relatively slowly. Uh, and then the whole thing collides with the interstellar medium, which wasn't suspecting anything. And there, there you have a relativistic blast wave going at initially uh, large gamma factor. So uh, by modeling the, the afterglow and prompt emission of gamma reverse, uh, we can infer what kind of uh, energetics uh, is present in the outflow. So we can infer what kind of uh, magnetic energy you, you need to have in the flow and what kind of uh, particle energy you need to have in the flow. And the typical numbers that people infer is that the magnetic energy fraction, so if you take a, a piece of the uh, fluid uh, uh, behind one of these shocks and ask what is the energy budget, uh, we find that uh, on the order of 1 to 10 percent uh, closer to 1% uh, of the energy is in the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, about 10 to 20% of the energy is in the electrons. And uh, that's the typical numbers you want, to, uh, you want to understand, explain where they come from. Because if you just take the uh, interstellar magnetic field and you try to compress it in a shock, you will get that the uh, magnetic energy fraction is going to be 10 to the minus 8. So something has amplified the magnetic field by you know, seven orders of magnitude. Uh, you're starting with essentially no magnetic field uh, and uh, you end up with uh, a significant fraction of energy in the magnetic field. How did that happen? Most likely that happened in a collisionless shock. Uh, the electron energy fraction is similarly, uh, if you just take the uh, interstellar medium uh, electrons, compress them in the shock, you won't get 10% uh, of uh, gamma reverse energy. That, this, this number means that there was some energy transfer between uh, protons are flying uh, at relativistic speed and, and electrons. So <coughs> we'll see how this comes about uh, later. So again, the composition here, uh, it's most likely electron ion plasma in the afterglow, most likely, well, we don't really know, but it could be either pairs or electron ions uh, in the internal shock. Okay, uh, let me skip this one. Uh, finally, let's talk about the supernova remnants. So these are examples of non-relativistic shocks. and. Uh, uh, there is now uh, growing evidence uh, that supernova remnants are definitely accelerating particles. So uh, this comes about uh, from these uh, X-ray emitting um, nebulae, sorry, X-ray emitting uh, supernova remnants, uh, where you see a very thin rim uh, of emission in X-rays. So here's an example of supernova 1006. You see a very thin rim of synchrotron emitting uh, gas, very similar for uh, Tycho. You see a very, very thin uh, rim of uh, synchrotron emitting particles and uh, people infer uh, energies to which this part these electrons are accelerated to be about 50 to 100 TeV. Uh, and uh, uh, we also see ultra high energy emission from these sources. So 100 GeV to TeV emission, uh, which are uh, now the Cass and Magic uh, telescope sources. So here is a plot 
uh, from CAS collaboration. This is an image of, the, of a supernova remnant in TeV uh, energy. So there's definitely electron acceleration going on. You can see that it's probably local, uh, the fact that it's, it's a, a thin rim uh, around this uh, supernova remnant. So we also think that supernova remnants accelerate cosmic rays, of course. So, um, and there is now evidence that these supernova remnants are also uh, amplifying the magnetic field. So we think uh, we would infer the typical magnetic fields to be a, a, a micro-gauss perhaps, but people infer hundreds of micro-gauss and maybe a milligauss magnetic fields in some of the supernova remnants. So the question is uh, how, does, how that happens. Uh, another um, uh, interesting uh, diagnostics of uh, supernova remnants is uh, recent uh, measurements of the uh, Balmer dominated uh, shocks. So this Balmer lines emitted by plasma going, uh, going through a shock due to charge exchange uh, reactions. And uh, what people can infer there is uh, by, uh, they, they can model the uh, electron and ion temperature uh, uh, in the shock plasma, uh, they can model the, the ratio of the electron to ion temperature by measuring uh, the relative widths of different uh, uh, contributions to Balmer line profile. And uh, what uh, what is inferred is the TE over TI uh, such that with higher shock velocity, so we're going from uh, under a thousand kilometers per second to a few thousand kilometers per second, you can see that the uh, temperature uh, ratio is falling. And it seems like it's falling in a very interesting fashion. It seems like it's falling like one over velocity squared. Uh, which, if you think about it, means uh, a rather remarkable thing. It means that the constant amount of energy is going into electrons. Uh, from even though the ion energy is changing. So as you increase the shock velocity, the, the kinetic energy of the flow is increasing, yet the uh, amount of energy that electrons get seem to be constant, uh, independent of the shock velocity. That is very, very strange and very, uh, very unusual. So we'll see if this can be reproduced uh, from first principle. So, uh, so as, I, as I described, we have a whole range of uh, both uh, Lorentz factors are going from relativistic shocks uh, uh, for pulsar wind nebulae and gamma ray bursts to non-relativistic shocks for supernova remnants. And uh, uh, composition, again, ranges from electron ion to pairs and uh, uh, perhaps pairs plus ions. And you can see uh, the astrophysical examples sweep the whole range of uh, magnetization. So a magnetic field is um, relatively unimportant for gamma ray bursts. So you start with about 10 to the minus 9 fraction of energy uh, in uh, magnetic field to perhaps order unity uh, magnetic fields when they're amplified in the supernova remnants. So, uh, so these are the uh, properties of these shocks. They accelerate, they amplify, and they seem to be equilibrating electrons and ions. Now the big question is uh, how, and let's see, uh, so the, how can we uh, model this uh, type of um, physics? So what we do is we uh, simulate the plasma physics from basically first principles. So we start with uh, uh, Maxwell's equations and equations of motions for uh, constituents of uh, plasma, electrons, protons, and, and positrons potentially. And uh, we discretize it as uh, particles. So for those of you doing cosmological simulations, this is just uh, uh, another way of saying particle mesh method. So we call it particle in cell method, but it's basically the same thing. So uh, each particle has a charge. Uh, as it moves through the grid, uh, the current that this par particle possesses gets deposited onto the grid. Uh, the current is a source for Maxwell's equations, and you can evolve Maxwell's equations, evolve your fields given the currents, and then the fields control the particle motion, so you have a self-consistent loop that you can repeat over and over and over. So it's uh, very simple, uh, very fundamental. There is uh, no binary collisions if you don't put them in, uh, but uh, particles do interact with each other through long range and collective electromagnetic fields. So, uh, of course, nothing comes free. Uh, the, uh, you, you, you pay for the fact that you're not uh, making many assumptions. The price is that it's very computationally expensive. That's why uh, interesting uh, multi-dimensional simulations have only been able to uh, be run uh, relatively recently. So uh, the results I'll show you is a um, code that uh, we developed, which is uh, called Tristan MP. And uh, it's a 
parallel uh, particle and cell code that can uh, evolve uh, many billions of particles. We've run, we've, we went up to, I think, 30 billion at some point, but this is just a su suicidal runs. Uh, but when, only when you really need to. But what's interesting is that a lot of physics can actually be recovered in two dimensions. So I'll show you some two-dimensional results, uh, which are much cheaper and can be run uh, relatively uh, easier. Okay, so uh, of course uh, this is a complicated, uh, I mean a simple physics, but can, can become uh, complicated uh, uh, when you run uh, the full simulation. So it's, it's always uh, the worry that keeps me up at night is whether I'm doing anything bad, whether this is completely wrong. So uh, now uh, there are other groups that are starting to produce similar results. So uh, it's just a matter of time and large computers. But uh, the algorithm is basically solid. And it, we're maybe all we're doing the same mistakes, but, but we're, we're converging onto the same answer. So, uh, well, that's the nature of this stuff, right? Uh, make sure they're not reading your papers. They are. <laughs> but that, that's, you know, that, that helps them to make, make, make it faster, right? OK, so uh, here's a typical setup that I'm going to describe. So all we're really doing, we're taking a slab of plasma, actually two slabs of plasma, if you will, and then we're colliding them together, OK? But we're not allowing for binary collisions. We're just doing it with, in full plasma physics. And uh, uh, for relativistic shocks, I'll typically be using uh, gamma of about 15, which is not too small and not too large. It's sort of mild. Uh, well, it, it's, it's good, good relativistic uh, velocity. Uh, so if, just from your hydrodynamical intuition, if you were to collide uh, two shells like this, what you would get is a contact discontinuity and a shock propagating that way and a shock propagating this way. Depending on the dimensionality, if it's a three-dimensional uh, gas, you will have shock moving at C over three. If it's a two-dimensional gas, it will be C over two uh, because the adiabatic index is different. Uh, so uh, in, this, in this simulation, uh, you would have a shock propagating through the domain, and this flow would be still incoming at roughly the speed of light. Uh, now, of course, as you can see from here, I'm wasting uh, half of my computer resources because I'm going to be simulating two shocks uh, propagating there and there. So why not just put a wall? Uh, so you can put a wall and then these particles reflect off this wall and then they also drive a shock uh, through this uh, upstream. Now, you may not that this is okay, but you can't believe how many questions I get because of this setup. It's okay, it's fine. I've tried colliding two beams without a wall. It gives you exactly the same results. So don't worry about it, trust me. Uh, <laughs> I know I've been through this. Uh, it, it, it's it's not. I mean, it, it's not intuitive why why reflecting off a wall is the same thing as carrying another beam through it. But it's okay. So, uh, in other words, of saying this, uh, in, in other words, this is a simulation in the so-called downstream frame. So it's a frame of the contact discontinuity because the contact is steady, but the shock is propagating in this frame. This is actually advantageous because if you're interested in, in the spectrum of particles. Uh, you don't want to boost them uh, by arbitrary gamma factors, which you don't really know what they are to begin with. Uh, you're guaranteed that the downstream medium is at rest with respect to your wall. So if you measure a spectrum, it's your real spectrum. You don't need to boost it around. Uh, okay, so the, the thing that we're not doing is we're not simulating the formation of a contact discontinuity. If you're really colliding two different kinds of uh, fluid, there may be some intermixing. It's another story. Uh, this also can be done, but we're just going to, I'm just going to be showing you this wall collision. Okay, so uh, what is the uh, physics that uh, uh, underlies all of these collisionless shocks? So uh, depending on how fast you're moving, there are various uh, different regimes of physics that can appear. Uh, also depending on whether you have background uh, electric or background magnetic fields or not. So uh, a classical solution that was found back in the uh, early, um, late 50s, early 60s is the uh, electrostatic soliton solutions where you have uh, electron and proton plasma uh, trying to decelerate. So you need to decelerate your protons. One way to decelerate them is to impose electric field on it. So you, you can create an over density of protons behind the shock that will be kind of pushing back on the protons that are incoming with electric field that will slow it down. And uh, that way you can go, you can have these uh, beautiful uh, soliton solutions called Sagdeya solitons. Uh, it works wonderfully except that the range of applicability is rather limited. The sonic Mach number can be no more than 1.6. Uh, 
In astrophysics, we have much larger sonic Mach numbers, you know, hundreds and so forth. So something else must happen. And what typically happens is that uh, the shock manages to send some particles back into the upstream. So it manages to reflect some particles, and then those particles going against the incoming flow produce various instabilities, and those instabilities create fields which can scatter particles. So that's the whole idea. How you reflect particles is your, your business, but you have to reflect them. So uh, how this happens in practice, typically you have magnetic fields. So if you have magnetic fields, uh, here is an example. You have um, an upstream flow going uh, before it encounters the shock. Uh, e cross B velocity gives it, let's say it goes on a straight line. And then as it goes through the shock, the tangential electric field has to stay the same, but the magnetic field gets compressed. Uh, as you go through the shock. So the particle starts to gyrate uh, in an E cross B orbit. Now notice that here it was moving at one velocity and here it's going to be moving at at least half of that velocity on average, right? Because even though it's zooming around, but on average its bulk motion is slowed down. So by just compressing magnetic field and uh, we we're creating these uh, reflected particles uh, which are just gyrating. Uh, in extreme cases, uh, these particles never get a chance to complete their orbit and they're just sent back towards the upstream and that's where various interesting instabilities can happen and you can have some filamentations and so forth. So uh, uh, filamentary uh, tur turbulence uh, and creation of electromagnetic field is the hallmark of these uh, collisionless shocks. So uh, here is um, uh, a parameter space of, uh, of the shocks, uh, the way I understand it at the moment, is uh, you have several dimensionless numbers. So you have uh, what's known as the alpha and Mach number, which is the ratio of velocity to the alpha and velocity. So this presumes some uh, background magnetic field. Uh, you can have composition, which is the ratio of the ion to electron mass. Uh, it could be one if you were talking about electron-positron pairs. It can be 1800 if you're talking about real plasmas. Uh, and uh, you can also have sonic Mach number, which is the velocity over the sound speed. I'm typically going to treat the uh, very uh, cold incoming flow, so low, um, uh, low sound velocities, which means a very large sonic Mach number. So this is, this is usually not going to be uh, a parameter. So uh, you can see here that uh, you can express the magnetization, which is the ratio of magnetic energy to the kinetic energy, as just 1 over the Mach number squared, the alphanic Mach number squared. Another way to say it is it's the ratio of the uh, skin depth, which is the speed of light over the plasma frequency, it's a typical uh, scale in your plasma, divided by the Larmor radius uh, of, your, of your particles. Uh, and, uh, or another way to say it is omega c over omega p, which is the cyclotron over the plasma frequency, times the uh, v over c, which is the velocity of your flow. Okay, so based, uh, based on, these, um, uh, on this dimensionless number, which is magnetization, uh, and the composition, you can uh, define four uh, different regimes of the parameter space. So uh, over here, I'll have very small sigma or very low magnetic field. So these are going to be unmagnetized flows. Initially, no, no background magnetic field. And uh, here, I'll have high magnetic fields. And depending on whether we are low or high, we'll have different uh, uh, shock mediation mechanisms. So, uh, when magnetic field is high, we'll have uh, shocks mediated by magnetic reflection, as I just showed in the previous slide, particles are going to gyrate in the background magnetic field. In the low magnetic field, we'll have what's known as a Weibull instability, which is a filamentation, electromagnetic filamentation instability, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, and then uh, as you go to electron ion plasmas, you will have an ion Weibull instability, a uh, similar streaming uh, filamentation instability. And Finally, for magnetized electron ion shocks, you will have magnetic reflection and some electrostatics because you can separate electrons and protons uh, in one line or orbit. Okay, so what's interesting is that the astrophysical uh, implications, which is the efficiency of shock acceleration, the presence of shock acceleration, may depend on which mechanism is mediating your shock. So you may have different efficiencies of acceleration depending on which, which end of this parameter uh, space you are in. Now, uh, this is just uh, a parameter space for relativistic shocks. In principle, there is also a third dimension here, which is the V over C. So uh, rel non-relativistic shocks will, will give you more complications. So it turns out that the relativistic shocks, surprisingly, are easier. That's why I've, I've been focusing more on, on them, because the parameter space is, is more 
is easier to define. Okay, so uh, let me show you a few examples. So let's start with um, relativistic pair shocks. And uh, I'm showing you here the three-dimensional volume rendering of uh, a density uh, in a shock. So this is a magnetized shock. So, there's a, so the flow is coming in like this, and then you, you, you have a jump in density, and the magnetic field was initially perpendicular to the flow. So you can see this is a uh, sharp, uh, nice transition here. Here, uh, an initially unmagnetized shock. So there was no initial background magnetic field. It still formed a shock, but you can see some interesting filamentation, uh, so filamentary structures in density. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's see how that developed. So, so here is uh, the incoming flow came in, collided with the wall, and then you have uh, a shock finally uh, propagating towards the upstream medium. And you can see that there is some filamentation uh, preceding the shock. Okay, so what happened here? Uh, what's happening is that even though initially I had no magnetic field to begin with, uh, magnetic field is generated from scratch. Uh, so here is uh, uh, an example. Here, here is, as this density is uh, going by, you see here the magnetic um, field lines in a plane perpendicular to the flow. So what you see is that you, you start with some very small loops, which eventually go to larger and larger scale. And you can see that finally you have these loops of magnetic field transfers to your direction of the flow. That's all this shock really wants, because a particle coming in like this, seeing a magnetic field transfers to the flow, will try to deflect in that magnetic field. As it tries to deflect, its net will, the bulk velocity decelerates, you've got the compression. So, uh, how do you deal with things that move out of your grid here, or is your grid much larger? Uh, this it this, this doesn't look like it's yeah. rushing if I look at that. This, this one just hit the wall here, but this is a uh, just for demonstration purposes. In, in reality, my wall is not there. Okay. So all, all I wanted to show here is that this, this instability, whatever it is, is creating transverse magnetic fields. Uh, so if you actually um, allow a, sh a shock to form, you need to run a relatively large simulation, but if you do, then what, this is the density profile that you see. So the jump conditions actually satisfy what your hydrodynamics or MHD tells you. Uh, but we're actually resolving the, the transition. So there is no magic, no viscosity, no artificial heating, anything like that. Everything is resolved there. Uh, the typical transition is a uh, you know, hundred skin depths, uh, which is astrophysically tiny. You know, skin depth in an astrophysical plasma is seven kilometers. Okay? Uh, so, I'm talking about ridiculously small scales. But uh, if you run large enough simulations, the, you start uh, finding something more meaningful. OK, so let, let me quickly explain how this instability works. So it's not complete magic, although the contrast here may not work. So uh, imagine that you have two sets uh, of electrons going through each other. Okay, So let's say that the ions are not going anywhere. They're just providing neutralizing background. And uh, you have two, two sets of electrons going like this. So you have electrons going that way, electrons going this way. Now imagine a small perturbation of magnetic field in the plane transfers to the flow. So uh, there are vectors pointing down over here, and there are vectors pointing up here and down again. So I'm putting a sinusoidal perturbation. Okay? So the particles that are going uh, in this direction will deflect like this in, the, in this, uh, in this magnetic field. The particles that were going the opposite direction will deflect away from that uh, direction. Okay, so what you end up having is that in a certain region of space, you have net net number of particles going to the left, which means a current going to the right. Okay, so you've got a current in this in a location in space, and here you have a current going in the opposite direction. Now, what's beautiful about this is that this current is exactly what's needed to amplify to, to reinforce this magnetic fluctuation. So I put in a small fluctuation, a seed magnetic field, which can be noise level, tiny. Uh, and then it will filament the plasma such, in such a way to reinforce this magnetic field. And that's a recipe for an instability. Right? So the free energy for this instability comes from the counter streaming. Uh, it's not a natural state of affairs. You want everything to be Maxwellian, right? But, but you have a counter streaming. So uh, that uh, isotropizes it by creating this uh, transverse magnetic field. The instability is very vigorous. It grows on the skin depths and, uh, and, free, and the uh, time scale is typically the uh, plasma time. OK, so let me show you how this looks in a three-dimensional shock. So this is the uh, density profile through the shock. 
And this is the magnetic energy profiles through the shock. So as you can see, the magnetic energy was zero upstream, and then it got generated uh, some magnetic field over here, which comes to about 10 to 15 percent of equipartition with, with the kinetic energy. So it's an appreciable magnetic field. And then it starts to decay after its job is done uh, on isotropizing the flow. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to be showing you in this, uh, in this panel is the transfer slice. So this plane is perpendicular to the direction of the flow, and you're going to see the magnetic um, filaments uh, that are appearing, the structure of magnetic field as you go through the shock. Okay, so here we are in the upstream. This is just noise level. Um, the, the total energy is very tiny. And then as you get closer and closer, you will see that the energy starts to grow. And you also start to see some patterns in the magnetic field. So you've got these large loops uh, of magnetic field sitting in front of the shock. Okay? And the plasma is still, still going strong towards the shock. And then uh, you see some secondary filamentation on some smaller scale. You see some small scale loops that are starting to merge together. And finally, we're going through the shock right now. And we're scattering um, uh, the, uh, these magnetic fields scattered the incoming flow. And you have a random uh, turbulence uh, now in the downstream. OK? So, uh, so what's happened here is, um, oh, let, let me show you another way of looking at it. This is a uh, rendering of the uh, magnetic energy. So the, sh the flow is coming in that way. The shock is moving towards the lower right. And uh, what you're seeing is that these are these magnetic filaments, which in cross-section look like loops uh, of magnetic field. So there's a cross-section of loops like this, uh, which are isotropizing the flow. OK. Uh, this is. Uh, the trajectories of particles, so what the, the individual segments here are uh, a few time steps of the partic uh, around each particle's trajectory. So what you're seeing here is that the particles are basically going towards the shock on straight lines, and then they get scattered. So the background color here is the magnetic energy. Okay, so the, this is the shock, and it's propagating towards the upstream. And as particles hit the shock, they start uh, being deflected by large angles. And uh, here, this is the downstream region. So uh, if I didn't show you the background magnetic field, it would look like the particles are colliding. It would look like their orbit is not really a straight line. It gets deflected quite a bit by this, by this collective magnetic field. So even though I'm calling it collisionless shock, it's really a misnomer. There are, there are collisions, but it's, it's just not collisions between particles. It's collisions with the generated magnetic field. OK, now, uh, uh, if you have a very sharp eye, you will see that there are some particles that are streaming towards the upstream. Uh, they're not really going with the flow. They're going sideways. And uh, there are very few of them, but they're very interesting. So uh, let me show you, uh, if you if you actually uh, look in the logarithmic, uh, logarithmic bins of density, uh, so, so, OK, so this is the density through the shock. This is the incoming flow. This is the shock flow. Uh, this is the profile of density. This is the profile of magnetic energy. Now, what this is is a space space. So this is the x direction, uh, and this is the momentum of, of particles, uh, the x momentum of particles. So what this means is this this beam uh, is the incoming flow. It has negative uh, momentum. <coughs> it's going into the shock, and then it's isotropizing in the shock. But then look at this. These are particles with positive momentum, and they're in the upstream. What are they doing there? They're going towards the upstream from the shock. So the shock has reflected some particles, and they're going back towards the upstream. And that's what's generating the instability. So it's not the reflection of the wall. Right? The wall is well, well gone. Uh, the, this, this is a self-propagating structure. And what's, what's making it work is the reflection of particles from the magnetic field that are self-generated in the shock. OK, now let's look at the properties of these particles. They're very interesting. So if you look at the downstream spectrum, uh, you see, uh, this is, so my, my initial flow had gamma 15, okay? Uh, and uh, the downstream flow has thermalized mainly. So this, this, most of the particles have thermalized around gamma 15, which is what you would expect if you just randomize their, their orbits without, uh, without changing their mean energy. So this is the 
this is the main thing. But then look at that. You also have a nice tail that's, that's growing with time. So uh, these three lines show the time evolution. So you start out with something that looks like sort of Maxwellian, and then with time, this tail grows to larger and larger energy. And uh, uh, the claim is, I claim that this is no longer fit by two Maxwellians. So at the very early stage, you could potentially fit it with two Maxwellians. If you, if, you, if you give it more time, it looks more and more like a beginning of a power law. So uh, over time, this, the two Maxwellian fit, which is shown here, is no longer fitting this distribution. So it looks like a power law uh, with about slope of 2.4 in energy. Uh, there is 1% of particles that end up in this tail. But what's really interesting is that they carry 10% of energy now. So by the end of your very large simulation, we build 10% of energy in, the, in these particles. And uh, that's now starting to modify the shock jump condition, actually. So we're at the stage where the feedback of these particles is starting to become important. Now, uh, how did they get there? Uh, if you look at, so this is the um, uh, x direction, and this is time. Okay, so the particles, uh, and, and, and this is the location of the shock. Okay, so the particle is moving towards the shock initially, and then it gets reflected in the downstream, goes goes towards the upstream, gets reflected, and see it's, it's bouncing around the shock. And every time it's bouncing around, its gamma is increasing. So every time it gets it bounces it bounces in the over here, it gets kicked by the upstream flow, and uh, that kick gives a net change in, in gamma. So this is the fundamentals of the Fermi acceleration. So what's cool about this is that we have no assumption going going into the simulation. There was no initial magnetic field, no initial turbulence, nothing. It it all generated by itself. The magnetic field appeared, and then the returning particles caused the uh, uh, cause the upstream turbulence and uh, just a certain fraction of particles gets deflected into the into this Fermi cycle. Okay, so uh, this is a two-dimensional simulation. Uh, I've done some 3D runs and the initial evolution is very similar. Of course, we can't run 3D for as long as we do in two dimensions, but the initial signature looks very similar. You start to grow the tail and uh, it seems like the injection works just as well. Now, uh, here is it. Most of the products seem to be escaping out the back. Is that not, that's just the... Um, okay, it was, right. Do they so escape out the front as well? They do both, but most of them do end up in the downstream. So uh, the nature of these relativistic shocks is that uh, it doesn't take a large pitch angle for, for the shock to, to eventually catch up with the particle. So uh, even though these, these are, right now they're escaping, but they won't go very far. If they scatter a little bit, eventually the shock will, will, will catch up with them. That question shortly. Um, so your magnetic correlation length, does this depend if your mass of your simulated particles and how large is this? Right, so the, the uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The, the typical correlation length of the field is on the order of the size of these filaments, which is a few tens of skin depths of the plasma. So the skin depth, depends on whether you're talking about electron ion plasma or electron positron plasma, but it's roughly on the on the order of a few tens of skin depth. This is independent of your simulated particle masses. I guess you have, I don't know, what is a, what is a simulated mass, what is the mass of simulated particle? What matters is the ratio of charge to mass. Oh, yes. So if for, it's for pairs it's one, for for protons it's one over, you know, one thousand if you want. So uh, that, that's all that matters. Can you get up to Yes. So I'll show you electron ion simulations in a second. Okay. okay. Uh, this is just to show you uh, a typical trajectory of the particle, uh, the ones that, that get boosted to high energy. So uh, what's shown here is this is the shock. This is the magnetic filaments going into the shock and receding from the shock. And you can see the trajectory of the particle as it skirts the shock. So what you what you find this is the gamma factor. As as the, as time goes on, the gamma factor is increasing. Uh, what you find is that the particles that get to highest energies, uh, they don't just bounce across the shock. They actually surf the shock. They they kind of they try to go parallel to the shock nor uh, shock uh, phase basically perpendicular to the shock normal, and th they try to sit on it as long as they can, just bouncing a little bit. The reason is that 
at the gamma factor they reach in the end, if they are to go perpendicular to the shock, they just cut through. They, they have enormous rigidity. So the way for them to increase effective optical depth of this, uh, of this magnetic field was to go sideways. And that's what I'm finding, that there's a significant amount of uh, particles just kind of going, uh, trying to serve the shock. So would you expect that to be uh, larger in 3D then, because you have more face space to go sideways? Yeah. Then you have a curved shock. Well. It's hard yeah. to say. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Naively, you would, you would, you would say so, right? But um, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. So, uh, so the bottom line on the unmagnetized shocks is that they do work. They do generate magnetic fields. The fields that you saw were decaying afterwards. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But uh, they also seem to be generating interesting accelerated particle population. Okay, now let's talk about magnetized shocks. So uh, again, it's only pairs for now. Uh, we have, uh, this is the momentum space that the particle comes in and then it starts gyrating as sort of the way I described before. So there is now significant magnetic field and you see, uh, you see these gyrations. Eventually those gyrations become randomized and you, 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 you thermalize downstream. Uh, and uh, the spectrum downstream looks very, very Maxwellian. So as, for as long as I've run it, with a perpendicular magnetic field, nothing happens. It doesn't seem to accelerate anything. We've done it in 2D and 3D, it doesn't seem to, to matter. So the conclusion at the moment is that magnetized pair shocks are lousy accelerators. So they don't seem to be doing much, which puts an interesting constraint on some astrophysics. We'll get to that later. Uh, now, we've also tried uh, with uh, Lorenzo Cironi, who's a grad student in the principle, we tried to uh, change the angle between the magnetic field and the flow. So uh, what, what I showed you was perpendicular flow, a perpendicular magnetic field, but now let's, let's change this angle. So here's the uh, distribution uh, for a 45 degree. This is a relativistic shock with gamma of 15, okay? So 45 degree inclination like this gives you essentially a Maxwellian uh, distribution. So no acceleration. Zero degrees gives you a nice tail. Okay? But what's curious is that as you go to 15 and 30 degrees, the tail becomes even more pronounced. And then you go 31, 32, and it's cut, it cuts off. Like the transition is almost instantaneous. Uh, why that happens is because the shock goes from the subluminal to superluminal, which means that the, in order for the particle to catch up with the shock, it has to move superluminally along the magnetic field at some angle. So if, if, you, if you tilt the angle too far, like 90 degrees, you, if you go along the field, you will never catch up with the shock, right? So there is a critical angle, which here it happens to be around 30 to 30 degrees, at which point this transition happens and uh, acceleration rapidly cuts off. The reason why there is more for 15 and 30 degrees is that uh, there is a, a phenomenon called uh, shock, shock drift acceleration, uh, which is, uh, so in addition to Fermi balances, there are some particles that can spend one half of the alarmer orbit on one side of the shock and another half of the orbit on the other side of the shock, and they can get even more energy that way. So uh, it seems like the oblique shocks also can accelerate, except you have to be within a certain angle range. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, astrophysically, this angle range is rather boring because um, if you consider it from the point of view of the upstream flow, the, ma the magnetic field gets boosted but to basically one over gamma. Uh, so the, these 30 degrees I'm talking about is, a down is it in downstream frame. In the upstream frame, it all gets uh, compressed within one over gamma, basically. So uh, you really have to have parallel shock, basically. And if you want to get acceleration in relativistic magnetized shock, it has to be parallel. Perpendicular seems to be not as good. OK, uh, let me skip this. Uh, there is an interesting uh, transition between uh, magnetized and unmagnetized shocks. As we change the magnetization, it's just one parameter. You dial the magnetic field down, the, mag the, the shock becomes more and more diffuse, and eventually you switch to these viable, viable shocks. And the typical transition I'm finding is on the order of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 uh, in the in magnetization, so the energy fraction in the magnetic field. So let me turn this off. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, I guess, quickly mention this thing. Uh, you, the acceleration is not enough. So you, you can have accelerated particles, but you also want to have magnetic fields in which those particles can radiate. 
So particularly for gamma ray bursts, uh, you need to, to generate magnetic field from scratch. And what we were finding is that the magnetic field, after it goes through the peak of the shock, it starts to decay. And uh, the question is, does it decay to completely zero, or is there some interesting level to which it, uh, to which it asymptotes? And uh, uh, if, uh, it, it, seem, it seems like there is, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I, I'm guilty of polluting the literature with two papers which are contradicting themselves. Uh, but they don't really. Uh, so what we, what we did is we took uh, one of these shock simulations and we put uh, a, uh, a line through the simulation. We're measuring the magnetic energy uh, in this slice as the shock was receding from us. So we basically were looking further and further in time from the shock. Okay? And uh, what you see here is the magnetic energy, you probably can't see, but basically, trust me, the, these lines just are, are falling in logarithmic space. So, so the magnetic energy is decaying. You can see it here. So there are some islands downstream over here, but then they become sparser and sparser, and they seem to be falling apart. Okay, so we concluded that with a high resolution simulation, we ran it below 1%. Uh, actually 0.1% of the equipartition, and uh, we decided that it doesn't work for gamma ray bursts. So uh, it seems like the magnetic field fell below what, what is expected to, to help in gamma ray bursts. Now it turned out that we weren't waiting long enough. So uh, here are some uh, more recent simulations where we uh, look at the shock uh, at an early stage and at, at the late stage. What you see here is that this is the upstream region, this is the downstream region. Uh, you can see that with time, there is something appearing in the upstream. There are some uh, large, large kind of pockets uh, of magnetic field appearing in the upstream that are propagating towards the, uh, towards the shock. And this actually results over time in an increase. Uh, so the shock kind of rejuvenates itself. It creates more and more magnetic energy as it propagates. Now, what's going on here? It turned out that the accelerated particle that we were finding seemed to be affecting the shock structure. So uh, here is um, here is these magnetic uh, pockets that I'm talking about in the upstream, and uh, with with time there are more and more of these propagating uh, towards the downstream, and then changing the scale and the, the magnitude of the magnetic field in the downstream. And uh, why they happen is because. Uh, these accelerated particles are coming back and changing the structure of the turbulence uh, in the upstream region. So here, uh, oh, let me just stop this. Uh, oops. Okay. Um, here's a simulation uh, which artificially turned off the, mag uh, the accelerated particles. So this is the magnetic energy uh, in the upstream and the downstream, and uh, this simulation retained the accelerated particles. So you can see that when there are accelerated particles present, the structure of the upstream turbulence dramatically changes. So you seem to be amplifying more and more magnetic fields with these accelerated particles, and then they propagate and change the, uh, the structure of the field downstream. So it seems like at the moment, uh, we, if we wait long enough, the, these accelerated particles can bring the field up at least to 1% of the co-partition. How far that goes away from the shock still needs to be understood, but at least there is some mechanism now, and we, we still need to understand what exactly is the mechanism, but it seems to be related to the returning particles. Okay, so the magnetic field generation uh, is, seems to be there. Now, what about electron ion shock? So, uh, too bad this picture doesn't work. Uh, but uh, what's shown here is the uh, simulation of mass ratio of 500 between ions and electrons, I've gone to a thousand, and it's basically the same idea. So, what you see here is the ion density. This is the upstream. This is the downstream. You can see filamentation, perhaps, uh, in the in the ion density as it, as the flow goes in and goes through a shock, and the magnetic energy also creates <coughs> these islands uh, and goes through the shock, and uh, there are islands of magnetic energy downstream. So sorry about the, this picture, but let me show you the time evolution here. So this is the. Uh, the shock is starting to appear here and it's propagating towards the right. The flow is coming in from, the, uh, from there. Uh, so what you're seeing is filamentation of the flow and the eventual um, isotropization in the downstream. The jump conditions again seem to, seem to work okay. Now, so the shock works in electron ion plasma. So what are the properties of these shocks? Uh, 
<coughs> the most striking thing about them is that the shock is essentially makes itself look like a pair shock. Basically what happens is that there is a vigorous transfer of energy between ions and electrons. So initially we start out with, uh, so this is a, uh, this is a momentum space of, uh, of uh, ions and momentum space of electrons. So this is an incoming beam and these are reflected ions coming back. Again, this is an incoming electron beam and reflected electrons. But here what I'm plotting is the energy in two components of the flow. This is the energy in the ions uh, divided by the total initial energy. So initially, all the energy is in the ions. And then as you go towards the shock, they lose about 30% of their energy. And that energy went into electrons. So you can see here electrons gaining energy as it goes through the shock. So it seems like these shocks are very good at of trying to reach equipartition. So electrons gained a significant fraction of the energy of the ions by the time they went through. And uh, this is clear in spectra as well. So the ions initially were at high gamma, at high gamma factor and electrons uh, at low energy and eventually they almost thermalized. Uh, okay, so let me skip this. Um, the similar heating seems to happen even in magnetized shocks. So uh, for magnetized shocks, uh, we have here the, uh, again, this is the momentum space uh, of, of uh, electrons, this is the momentum space of ions, you see uh, these gyrations uh, in, the in the magnetic field, and this is the energy partition, so initially all the energy is in the ions, and then they lost about 20%, and here the electrons gained that 20%. So this heating seems to happen in this first loop of the, uh, of the ions, uh, there is uh, both electric field and both and magnetic field happening at the same time. So uh, the actual amount of heating seems to depend on the magnetization of the flow. So depending on which sigma you, you have, you may get different uh, percentage. But uh, essentially, these perpendicular shocks are very good at uh, reaching almost uh, equipartition. So they're very good heaters. Uh, they, uh, they don't seem to be accelerating particles very well. So this is the spectrum. It looks still rather Maxwellian, both in ions uh, and electrons. So this work, the heating work, and the relativistic shock? Yes. So let's talk about that. Uh, uh, so the relativistic shocks are harder. Uh, they, there is, so, okay. So let me show you a few, few things I understand at the moment. Uh, remember, so the extra parameter in, in non-relativistic shocks is velocity over C. So it's not, it's not just enough to have ma a magnetization or the Mach number. It's also, you also need to know what the velocity is. And that may be an extra free parameter uh, in the problem. So uh, here are uh, the uh, two simulations with um, different Mach numbers. This is Mach number three, which means high magnetic field. And this is low Mach number, so, sorry, this is the uh, Mach number 30, which is the lower magnetic field. So th again, this is momentum space, uh, and what you're seeing is that ions start to undergo this gyration, uh, except they never quite make the full circle, and there is some instability that start to appear here in the reflected ions. And uh, yes, there is some energy transfer between ions and electrons. How, how much there is depends on uh, several factors. So here is uh, a preliminary uh, plot of the same type as you, as I showed you for the supernova remnant. So the ratio of electron to ion temperature versus the velocity. Except I can actually plot it as a function of four velocity. So uh, here we have non-relativistic flow. So 0.01 is 3,000 kilometers per second, you know, 30,000 kilometers per second. And then here we go relativistic. So in the relativistic shocks, the equilibration is quite nice. In the non-relativistic shocks, it depends on which velocity you're talking about. So uh, it seems like I can reproduce the general trend that is observed in the supernova remnants. Uh, so with the higher the velocity, the lower is the ratio of T over Ti. But the cheat here is that I'm free to dial the magnetic field. So I'm free to choose my alphanic Mach number. Uh, so when you, when you look at the data from the supernova remnants, they know the velocity of the shock. So they know this axis. And they can measure T over Ti, but they don't know what magnetic field is. So that seems to be the, in this case, it, it's a free parameter that I can dial to get basically any curve you want. But the heating seems to be there as well in the non-relativistic uh, non 
So um, that's not that what you need. I mean, their transition happens at 300 kilometers per second, so another full order of magnitude lower, right? If I remember their curves right. It's like right, so, so we, that's, that seems you would go to, I mean, if I see your curves, you, you, you can't quite go there. Well, if, so if I pick a lower Mach number, so then I can I can probably do it. So what I'm what well, okay, this is a logarithmic scale. What I'm what yeah, I'm yeah. saying yeah. here is something's weird. So we were inferring Mach numbers for for supernova remnants based on the interstellar medium magnetic field. If the fields are amplified, mm -hmm. the Mach number, the effective Mach number goes down. So you have larger magnetization of the flow. So we may not be inferring the right. Mm -hmm. The right value. Uh, okay, so let me, let me jump to the conclusions here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So sorry, th this was one of the turbulence runs that we we had uh, <laughs> in uh, generation of magnetic fields that stream of the shock, and it gave me this, and I, I was I wanted to scream. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let me let me recap here. So uh, this is the uh, general parameter space that we discussed. Uh, we have um, uh, mediation mechanism going from magnetic reflection to filamentation instabilities uh, to perhaps combination of uh, electrostatic and magnetic reflection. Uh, and uh, the conclusions at the moment seem to be that there is no Fermi uh, for the <coughs> magnetized shocks. Uh, there is Fermi injection for the unmagnetized shock, and there is some Fermi injection for oblique for relativistic shocks. Uh, in the electron ion case, it doesn't seem to be doing anything for the perpendicular magnetic fields. So the way it could have potentially done it, if the, if the turbulence downstream was so big that uh, the shock was just too turbulent, then the particles could potentially cross the shock, even if it was superluminal. But the, the intrinsic turbulence level doesn't seem to be enough to do that. Uh, and uh, for electron ion shocks, for uh, unmagnetized electron ion shocks, there seems to be both Fermi injection and electron heating. So let me conclude with a few applications to, to astrophysical scenarios at the moment. So uh, we talked about the, that the pair shocks seem to be accelerating well when they're at low magnetization. So perhaps this is a uh, sign uh, about the pulsar wind nebulae. So in pulsar wind nebulae, what we we see this equatorial uh, shock, which happens where this uh, alternating current sheet of the pulsar wind gets uh, interacts with the supernova remnant. And uh, in this uh, alternating uh, current sheet, there could potentially be magnetic reconnection that happens. As the flow gets further and further from the pulsar, it gets towards the shock, uh, there could be pot potential magnetic reconnection. So you end up with a lower effective magnetic energy in the wedge uh, surrounding the equatorial region of the pulsar. And that, that would be consistent with these shock, shock simulations because that would imply that this inner equatorial wedge it has a lower magnetization that, uh, than perhaps the rest of the nebula. Uh, in that case, I can see how it can accelerate particles uh, efficiently. Uh, in other uh, applications uh, for gamma ray bursts, so gamma ray bursts seem to be uh, very easy to explain now because uh, the very low magnetizations that people infer uh, in the afterglow uh, emission is very good for accelerating particles. So it seems like we can both amplify the field and accelerate particles. Uh, what's also important is that the we see this exchange of energy between ions and electrons. So the 10% uh, of energy fraction in electrons that people infer seems to be uh, consistent with the shock simulations. Uh, I can talk to you about the mechanism how electrons get heated. I'm running out of time. We can talk later. Uh, the, uh, the magnetic fields near 1% are perhaps, perhaps also not unreasonable because this self-accelerated self uh, particles uh, interacting with upstream medium seem to be able to sustain longer, larger scale magnetic fields. Now, implications for AGM jets are that uh, if you think that the AGM jets are consi consisting of electron positron flow with transverse <coughs> magnetic field, good luck making them shine. I don't know how to do it. They don't seem to be accelerating anything. So I, I would argue that they must have magnetic fields somehow parallel to the direction of the flow. 
some, how, how they do it, I don't know, perhaps it's some sort of a, a shearing flow in, or sheet flow or something like this, but just a plain perpendicular magnetic field doesn't seem to work for electron positron shots. Uh, for supernova remnants, um, again, this uh, parallel magnetic field never hurt anybody, so it seems like having a more parallel magnetic field the better as, for, for as far as the particle acceleration is concerned. And uh, perhaps this example of 1006 is uh, going in that direction. I think people are inferring now that the magnetic field is sort of uh, aligned along the axis of the nebula. Uh, also, the uh, electron ion temperature measurements, perhaps can, uh, if, if, we really, um, if we evolve these simulations to the point where we, uh, we really trust these non-relativistic simulations, then uh, the measurements of electron ion temperature equilibration could be a signature of the magnetic field amplification and the uh, in these shocks. So we'll be able to infer the magnetic field by just measuring electron ion temperature. Okay, and just to conclude, uh, we're now at a stage where shocks are routinely reproduced in the, uh, on the computers, uh, and uh, th we now understand uh, at least relativistic shocks, non-relativistic shocks are perhaps harder to understand, but we'll get there eventually. Uh, the exciting thing is that we see this uh, self-consistent injection of particles into, into the Fermi process and the efficiency of 1% and the energetics of about 10% is not contradicting anything we know about astrophysics. So that's, that's good. Um, the um, the f further work uh, is centering right now on understanding the amplification of magnetic field due to these backstreaming particles and how interaction of cosmic rays with the upstream can change the, uh, the, uh, the magnetic field. Uh, there are interesting instabilities right now. Uh, one of them is called Bell's instability, where the uh, backflow and protons can actually change the magnetic field in a, uh, in a non-trivial way. So we're trying to simulate that as well. And it seems to be uh, a good, good instability, seems to be able to amplify a significant amount of magnetic field. I didn't talk about that, but uh, I'm happy. I'm around tomorrow, we can, we can talk more. Okay, thank you. So, uh, the gross dif I mean, there are differences, of course. There, there are different adiabatic indices, uh, so the compression is different, uh, but the fundamental physics seems to be very similar. So, of course, we haven't run 3D as long as we've done 2D, because it's just prohibitive. But, uh, so far, I've not seen significant differences. Uh, there are some theories that say that uh, Fermi acceleration could be more efficient in 3D, and it, it couldn't be, it couldn't exist in 2D uh, for certain magnetic configurations. So it is actually theorem. Uh, so uh, that's why we've done some of the perpendicular magnetic field sh uh, shocks, both in 2D and 3D, just to see that. And there doesn't seem to be any difference. For the uh, long-term evolution of the field, presumably the build-up to larger and larger magnetic field structures matters. So do you see a significant difference depending on how wide you make your boxes? Right, so uh, as long as the structures that I'm generating are smaller than the box, uh, we've, we've converged. So we've tried the different uh, sizes of the box, and as long as what you're making is within the box, you're fine. Right, but so aren't you looking for the development of magnetic field structures that will decay slowly, so they presumably on the largest possible scale? Uh, right, so we, we have some struct, some field on the largest possible scales. Uh, there isn't enough of it, I mean, we, we're on relatively large boxes. There isn't enough of it on such large scales to cause trouble at the moment. And uh, I'm not sure that it will continue to evolve to an arbitrary scale. There may be a cutoff. So Shouldn't this depend on the maximum of energy of your cosmic rays that go upstream? Uh, if the, uh, see, there are very few of them. So. I think what's what's causing the the damage is the bulk of the cosmic rays near the injection. So so it's not the ultra high energy ones. It, it's the you know, it, it's a slope more than two. So the energy is in the low end of, of the distribution. Do you consider uh, resonant beams significant? Have I? Beams that 
Which is the word? Pini. Pini. Uh, you mean the alpha and wave generation? Or, or yeah, yeah. Especially on the, in the upstream. So you see, I think you see some different type of flows. Yeah. 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 Ye